Hi, Joe. How are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning from you uh, exactly how to unlock our kids' learning potential. I'm sure all the parents listening, um, this is really, really important stuff to us. Uh, so today we're going to go over uh, Joe's new book, Limited, L Limitless Mind, in which she goes over the six keys to sort of unlocking the potential of any person's, not just children, but any person's ability to learn. Um, and then we'll go into some other questions that I have, actually, just to, you know, <laughs> for my own self-serving purposes uh, right. regarding <laughs> uh, implemental implementability. I, I think I made that word up. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost-benefit analysis of some of what Joe talks about. And on a more local level, uh, GNT tests. That's kind of a big issue here in New York lately, uh, gifted and talented. It is. And I would love your, your feedback and your, your professional thoughts on that. And speaking of which, let's start off by getting into sort of your authority and your background and why you're such a smart person in this area and why we should all be listening to you. <laughs> um, so, um, so do, uh, correct me if, uh, if I'm getting any of this wrong. You are a uh, Stanford professor of math education. You are the co-founder of U-Cubed, which is a Stanford center that provides mathematical or mathematics education resources for teachers and students and parents, as well as the author of, I think it's eight other excellent books on how to teach and approach math. Does it, did, I, did I sum that up nicely? You did sum it up nicely. And the new book goes beyond maths. It's really about how we take these important ideas, not only into learning, actually, but into our lives. Um, I think there's a lot of important information here on how we lead companies and just generally how we live. Outstanding. So um, I'm going to let you, you run with it right here. I mean, you start off or you sort of, um, the framework of your book is centered around six principles, if, I, if I'm getting that correctly, or six mm -hmm. keys. So why don't, why don't we start there? Does that sound like a good way to start? Yes, that sounds a great way to start. So um, I can share the first one with, because I think it is perhaps the most powerful in unlocking people to live a much better life and to learn much more productively. And it's all the information we now have about our brain and how our brain is constantly growing and changing. And I work a lot with people in mathematics, teachers, students, parents. And I know that many people walk around on this planet thinking, I'm not a math person. So the evidence is overwhelmingly different to that because it shows that at every moment of our lives, our brains are growing and changing, developing new pathways, strengthening pathways. And really, anybody can learn anything is the key message of the book. The, uh, the anecdote in your book about the, uh, the monkey brains was a really great example of that, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I mean, this is really takes us to the origins of neuroplasticity and the very first sort of discoveries of brain growth. Uh, Michael Mertzenich is the neuro, neuroscientist who, uh, with his team, was mapping out the brains of monkeys. So they were looking at their brains and then they left that work and went away for a few weeks, went back to look at their brains again and found that they'd completely changed so at first they were, I think, doubting themselves and thinking we must have done something wrong. What happened? Until it became clear that these brains were constantly changing. And at the time that they released this information, people were thinking, as many still do, that your brain is kind of fixed. It's either fixed when you're born or it's fixed when you become an adult and there's not much you can do to change it. So his work was pretty revolutionary and now we've had thousands of studies that have confirmed this amazing, incredible, changing brain that we all have. You also give a great example of the London taxi drivers. And actually, before we get into that, mm -hmm. I, I need to ask, do you have any background in neurosciences or did you sort of teach yourself or just familiarize yourself with that part of the material as you were working on this book? I actually am a faculty affiliate in the Neurosciences Institution uh, or Institute at Stanford. But no, my background is in education and learning. And it's in recent years that I've started to work with the neuroscientists and publish with them and uh, really get involved in their work. Well, you did a great job of sort of, I guess I would call it bridging the gap between education and neuroscience because it was, it was very digestible. You know, I don't have a background in there, but I, I felt like I was understanding what you were you're getting across. So that's great. That's a good sign, I would that's guess. what I was hoping for. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, bringing it back to the London taxi drivers, um, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You gave a great example of uh, of how these are adults, of course, and how I, I didn't know this, but I, I guess you're from you're from the UK. I, I believe I am. Yes. So I, I guess mm-hmm. the, the roads there are really tough to drive. Is that right? <laughs> yes, the London cab drivers. It's such an interesting case. Um, the neuroscientists decided to look at their brains because to become a cab driver in London, to drive a black cab, you have to take this incredibly hard test that's called the knowledge. I love that title. And to pass the knowledge, you have to have memorized 20,000 streets and all the connections between them in central London. So it's, it's extremely difficult. The average amount of times it takes to pass the knowledge is 12 times. And many black cab drivers study for five, six, seven years in order to pass it. So the neuroscientists thought this is interesting and they started to look at the brains of the black cab drivers and what they found was that after they went through this intense spatial training, the hippocampus of their brains significantly grew. Can you refresh, what, what, what does the hippocampus do yeah, in our brain? the hippocampus is a really important part of your brain, actually. It's involved when you do any sort of calculations or mathematics or spatial work. There's a lot of spatial uh, pathways. So it's a very important part of the brain. We all have, uh, you know, the hippocampus that's uh, developed in different degrees. So these black cab drivers really develop their hippocampuses by doing all this spatial work. And, you know, I think it's important to think that they didn't develop this spatial understanding by blind memorization, by staring at maps and trying to memorize them, which is really the uh, anomaly to many things that happen in schools. They developed it by driving the roads and experiencing them and seeing all the landmarks and so anyway, um, the neuroscientists found that their hippocampus had significantly grown. And this was pretty groundbreaking at the time because these were adults. These weren't mm-hmm. children uh, who experienced significant brain change. They also found that when people retired from being black cab drivers, the hippocampus shrank back down again. Not because of people were getting older, but just because they weren't using those pathways anymore. So how about some, I wonder if you can provide some context. How unusual is it to find that sort of growth in the hippocampus in an adult? And then follow up question, and mm-hmm. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know this is the neuroscience side of it, yeah. but um, is, are there drawbacks of an enlarged hippo, hippo, hippocampus? I mean, is there a cost on the brain or, or central nervous system that um, we might need to think about? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I mean, I the the question of how unusual is it i think this was the first documentation of it in research finding it but now neuroscientists know that our brains are in this constant state of flux of growth um and what we know is that when you develop a new area whether it's in the hippocampus or in other parts of the brain the growth it's not some people you know challenge this and say my brain's not getting bigger it's not growing out of my head but uh, actually, what's happened? It, what happens is the brain is connecting and becoming denser, with stronger and stronger sort of connections inside the brain, and all of those connections allow certain things to happen that couldn't happen before. But you're right that it is a question really of of what your brain focuses on. If your brain's really actively focusing on one part, it probably isn't drawing from other parts in the same way. And I think people write about this as the sort of competitive brain space, Mm -hmm. what you need and what you develop and what you use will be what's really active in the brain. Um, So, you know, what I think the big message of this is we can all develop those pathways we need. And it's really important to stop thinking that we have limits and that we can't do certain things. Yeah, that first key or principle really seems focused on sort of helping everyone believe or be aware that this is possible. And then the dominoes will sort of fall from there. If you don't have that initial belief or awareness, none of the rest kind of matters. You need to know that it's Mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love your use of the term dominoes. I mean, it really, I think that's correct. You have to know that you can really learn anything. And then the rest sort of uh, comes along after that. That's why I have it as the first key in the book. Right. Reading the book out of order would be a disservice. So make sure to do it. (laughs) Right. Exactly. 
So why don't we move on to the second key, which is, um, which I think is this, this one was really, I mean, I have a nine year old daughter, so uh-huh. this was just, <laughs> and we're talking yeah, about how mistakes and struggle are key. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Please let, let us yeah. uh, share with us. So that is the second key that I share the amazing evidence we have from neuroscience that when we're making mistakes, when we're struggling, those are really the very best times for our brains. Um, Jason Moser was one of the first scientists to uncover this when he found he, he had brain scans on people when they were taking tests. And he found that every time they got an answer wrong, there was more brain growth and activity than when they got answers correct. And so this was pretty interesting. And it's led to a lot more work that is showing that we want people to be struggling. And we want people to be making mistakes because those are the best times for our brain growth. And really, if we're not struggling, we're probably not learning. You have a great line that really, I don't know, for whatever reason, struck a chord with me that um, in the U.S., too many teachers want to save their str- their students from yes. the struggle. That's like, right. Bail them out even, right? It, uh-huh. that, that's right. It seems yeah. so true. And yeah. <laughs> and it's so common. And that's how I think we've all been trained as educators, that we want our students to be correct all the time and we want them getting correct answers and of course that's what students think they think that they should be getting things correct and if they're not that's really crushing for them but actually we should be providing environments that are very challenging that people are really struggling in their work but at the same time we need to provide an app you know we need to let people know that struggle is good we can't just have kids struggling without ever telling them <laughs> right. that actually we want you to be struggling because struggling is really positive for your brain. Taking it back just one moment away from and bringing it to the general almost societal concerns. Mm-hmm. Do you think any of this relates to, let's say, for example, the prevalence of social media, let's just say, and the ease at which we're all receiving our little tiny dopamine hits of likes and reshares and is that somehow tied to our resistance to struggle or, you know, feeling like we're ch- mm. challenging ourselves? That's a really interesting connection. I haven't really thought about that before, but I can see that that certainly can be something we should think about. Like when we're seeking social media, so we get likes and attention. So easily, uh, that, you know. <laughs> yes, that really is the opposite of being in a challenging situation. I must say, though, that the work I've done over recent years and the knowledge I've developed about struggle and brains has helped me in social media situations because I, like many others who have a big social media presence, get a lot of attacks on social media. And people who come after me and are really quite rude and aggressive right. and what, what it's helped me with is I think to myself in those moments, you know, I must have said something that's really had an impact for them. That's why they've come after me in this way, because it's, uh, you know, uh, something I've said is meaningful. And really, I've started to think that in let, I mean, the education system is so broken. If we're not being, if we're not causing people to really have to rethink and maybe become uncomfortable we're probably not being disruptive enough. So I think when people start to embrace challenge and see that it's good to be challenged, it's good to struggle, I think it changes a lot of things in their lives, actually. And I have quite a few people who were interviewed for the book who talked to me about when they got that different perspective on struggle, they started to interact differently with different people and not feel they had to go into every meeting as an expert. They realized that they could go into meetings and say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out. And it was really quite liberating for people, I think, in different ways in their lives. There is a lot of uh, uh, maybe too much, quote unquote, perfectionism that we put on ourselves. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. And perfectionism, I mean, people will proudly say I'm a perfectionist, but (laughs) a perfectionist is really a negative mindset. It's really one where you're, you know, feeling that you have to be correct all the time. It has to be perfect all the time. And that's not um, something that's very productive for people's learning or lives. Oh, for sure. And since perfection by even, you know, the most forgiving standards is quite difficult to attain, that means you're exactly. living a life of constant failure because you're not living up to your own perfection. That's not a good exactly. way to live. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good way to live. 
Cool. Uh, moving on to the um, the next key, ch- mm-hmm. changing change your mind, change your brain. This this gets a little, if I may say, almost new agey. Would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing actually. The evidence. I mean, you have to stop and really think think about it. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, it's the evidence that shows that what you believe about mm-hmm. yourself actually changes your brain. Um, and changes many things about your life. I mean, I, I share quite a bit of evidence in the book on mindset and health. And it, I told my wife I, that uh, I was thinking about exercising, so it's the same. <laughs> right. That study is very interesting. So one of some of the studies in the book show that what you, if you believe you're living a healthy life, you're actually live longer than if you don't believe that. And one of the um, experiments I share is how when they told a set of hotel cleaners, they told half of them that their exercise uh, was sufficient for the sort of standards of healthy living. They didn't tell the other half that. But 10 weeks later, the people they told that to were actually healthier uh, in really tangible terms. They had lower blood pressure, they were fitter, so it's really quite incredible. And then I think the study you were alluding to where <laughs> um, telling, getting people to imagine working out actually strengthens their muscles, uh, even if when they're not actually working out. That is really interesting. Joe, do you personally in your life, do you do affirmations or are you familiar with the affirmations? Um, what do you mean by affirmations? Tell me a bit more about that. There is a school of thought that through, I guess, the power of positive thinking, if you say, or even even better, write down mm-hmm. things that you'd like to happen in your, in your life, maybe mm-hmm. on a daily basis, uh, yeah, ideally on a daily basis, yeah, a, a surprising amount of the time, not every time, those things will happen for you. Interesting. Um, it, that's, this, is why, yeah. this is where I'm coming from when I was thinking new agey, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't practice that in a very uh, systematic way like I don't write down things that I hope will happen but I do think my mindset has changed in uh, recent years and uh, that changes how things happen in my life Um, it you know I've changed in the ways I interact with my own children and I teach at Stanford the ways I interact with students the ways we have business meetings in my team um, so it does infiltrate your life, I think, in really powerful ways. But I don't want to move on before I give you a chance to teach my listeners, who I, who I mentioned were a lot of New York City parents, yes. which, which is a group that has a, a certain type of personality. <laughs> um, you mentioned a key word, a three-letter word that you should add to any, um, uh, you should make sure to add when you're talking with your parents, your kids about, yes. you know, uh-huh. I, I, don't, I don't know if you know, you get what I'm referring to. <laughs> the word yet. You're talking about the yes. word yet. For sure. Yes. And always giving your children or other people you interact with a kind of a growth perspective on their learning. Now we know that fixed words are actually damaging for people. Mm-hmm. In some of Carol Dweck's work, she's the real mindset guru Um, They praised children when they did work for being smart. They told them, oh, you're so smart. That's really great. Mm -hmm. And the other people they praised for working hard. And then they offered them a choice of easy or a hard question. And 90% of the kids praised for being smart chose the easy question. Mm -hmm. Because once you're given that label, you become kind of fragile. You don't want people to think you're not smart. Um, And it's particularly damaging when we struggle, I mean, if you're somebody who's been told you're gifted Mm -hmm. or you have a special brain and then later on you struggle in some way, that struggle is really devastating. Mm -hmm. So what we want to be telling everybody is nobody's stuck with anything, whether it's a gift or a learning disability, everybody's on this growth pathway and, you know, struggle is a really important part of that pathway. So just to sum it up, smart, don't say it yet. Uh, it's not that you can't do math, you know, you're, you're, you can't do math yet, or you can't do this type, you know, long division yet, right. whatever the case yeah. may be. You haven't learned it yet yeah. is the better way to talk about it. And yes, I, I mean, what we know is that when parents praise their children for being smart, which of mm-hmm. course happens all the time across the US <laughs> and elsewhere, um, what, <laughs> what children hear is, oh, good, I'm smart. 
But then the next time they mess up on something, which they will, they think, oh, I'm not so smart. And they're evaluating themselves against this kind of fixed idea. Very good. Um, this preparing for this interview gave me a lot of um, soul searching regarding my parenting, if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, for me too, when I learned all this thing, all these things. Cool. So the next key that you talk about, which is super interesting, is um, the multidimensional, excuse me, multi multidimensional approach mm -hmm. to problems, I guess is the way we put it. And, yeah. Uh, talk, please talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I, um, also fascinating, it comes from the neuroscience at Stanford, Vinod Meaden and his group have shown that when we approach content, maths, for example, even a arithmetic problem like 7 plus 12, there are five different areas of the brain that light up, five different pathways, and two of them are visual pathways. And thinking visually is really important. People think or have thought in the past, oh, we have visual learners or we have auditory learners, but actually we all want to be thinking visually. And more importantly, what we all want to be doing is making connections in our brains. So when we see content in different ways, we could chat about maths, for example, with some numbers, but we could also use words or we could use visuals or we could build something together or move in certain ways. And all of those different representations of ideas, when we think about them together, cause connections to happen in the brain. And evidence has shown that the people who are really high achieving in life, what separates them from other people is they have a more connected brain with communication between these different brain areas. So a concrete example you give of how to, um, you know, this might seem a little um, uh, academic for somebody who's, who doesn't have the book in front of them. So a way to approach, my multi, uh, I, excuse me, an example of a multidimensional approach would be take a simple um, arithmetic problem and you, uh, I think you fold a piece of paper into uh, four quadrants, Yeah. Yes. So I talk in the book about something we do with teachers called diamond paper. Mm. You could fold a piece of paper up in a certain way and open it up and there's a diamond in the center and then four quadrants. And we encourage them to put a math question in the center and then have people answer it in four different ways with four different representations. Maybe they write a little proof. Maybe they draw something. Maybe they use the numbers. Um and you could do that with any content at all, whether it's maths or poetry or really anything. It's just, oh, I pause so much here because I'm just thinking so much of my own children. <laughs> but So please forgive me. Yeah, uh, that's good. good. The next key you mention is, um, I, I kind of wrote it down in my notes, as speed, no, mm -hmm. flexibility, yes. <laughs> that's right. Speed is out. Um, yeah, it turns out. Well, we know that the most powerful brains, the most powerful thinking is when people are thinking creatively and flexibly. And um, one, of the, one of the barriers to thinking creatively and flexibly is actually speed. And when we put speed pressure on people, it stops them being able to think creatively and flexibly in really uh, quite severe ways. I like... Um, a book I read recently, actually, by Leonard, I'm not sure how to say his last name, Leonard Lodino, perhaps, Lodino, Lodino. Anyway, uh, a book I read recently called Elastic, and it's written by a physicist. But he talks in there about how in the Western world, we've for a long time valued this sort of algorithmic thinking, very rational, very organized, which is great um, and useful. But that thinking can absolutely be done by computers. <laughs> There's another kind of thinking, elastic, creative, flexible thinking. He calls it the Zeus of human thought, that we're at ground zero at computers being able to engage in that kind of thinking. It's the human brain, though, has the capacity for that really amazing, conceptual, complex, creative thought. So if we agree that that's the kind of thinking we want people to be engaging with what we really need to be doing is de-emphasizing speed and procedural thinking i mean i imagine this book goes in a direction tell me please correct me if i'm wrong that 
since the um, speed-based thinking can easily be done by computers and we're heading in that AI-ish direction anyway, those jobs or those tasks won't exist for humans anymore. So you need to get out of there. (laughs) That's right. And not only computers, can computers do those tasks as well as humans, but they can do them better Better, and faster than humans. Right on. What they can't do is think flexibly and creatively. And I I use an example in the book, so I know this is hard to think about, like, what does this even mean? But I use an example in the book of taking a question like 18 times five. Mm -hmm. So if I ask people to think about 18 times five, some people can only think of an algorithm. They line it up in their mind, they cross and cross things out. But actually, there's many different ways of thinking about a problem like that. So some people say, I'm not going to think about 80 times five. I'm going to think about 20 times five and take off two fives. Some people say, I'm going to think about 10 times five and eight times five as separate. Some people, one of my favorites, say, I'm not going to think about 18 times five. I'm going to think about nine times 10. Actually gives you the same answer. And these are the sort of creative, flexible ways we want people to think. We don't want them to have one algorithmic approach. We want them to be able to be flexible with numbers and with other content in their lives. Absolutely. Uh, Very good. Multidimensional approach. Um, Yeah, so the last key, um, and this is the one where, this one you mentioned how collaboration helps with the learning. And, Mm -hmm. And the big takeaway I got away from this, and please tell me your thoughts, is that through collaboration, you basically have the so, sort of social proof that it's okay to struggle and that, um, that it's a process that yeah. you can go through together. I mean, that's one of the main... Uh, that that I, is that I one of the main takeaways, yeah. I cite a study in the book um, that actually took place at, at Berkeley, down the road from where I am, uh, where Uri Treisman, one of the maths professors, noticed that, uh, I can't remember the number, 60% of students were failing calculus And they were nearly all students of color. Hmm. And so he asked the question, like, what's going on? He noticed that Chinese American students were not failing calculus. So he asked, like, is this a cultural difference? What what's happening here? And what they found was that the difference between the two groups was that the Chinese American students worked together on maths problems. And so they instigated workshops at Berkeley where they just got people doing maths together And what they found was that failure rate dropped to zero in a very fast time. Now, what's happening there and what they found was that when people were working alone, when they struggled on something, they started to think, oh, I'm not a math person. I can't do this. Whereas when they worked with others, they realized everybody struggles. And that realization, as well as the power of having people connect together on ideas, changed everything for them. I, I, when I first learned about the concept of social proof, I, I did kind of, uh, I don't know, doubt it or chafe at it, but you just keep seeing it pop up in so many different areas, even in mm-hmm. education. And um, we are, I guess we are yeah. social creatures. There's no denying it. We yeah. are social creatures. And I mean, you could make the argument that everything we learn is social knowledge, really. Even when we sit and read a book on our own, mm. we're connecting with the ideas of an author that's written that book. And that connection between ideas when people connect with another person's ideas, it both requires a higher degree of understanding, but it also develops one. And neuroscientists know now, too, that there's a whole kind of connecting part of our brain uh, that gets activated when we're connecting with other people. And yes, I mean, a really important part of our going forward in education is working out how can we get those connections to happen And how do they happen when in classrooms? I talk in the book about ways of creating really good collaboration in classrooms because it's really important. Maths classes are the worst probably for having kids sit on their own and do maths problems. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm glad we laid down that groundwork. I don't want to go too much deeper into the book because I think it would be a disservice. You need to really pick it up and, and read it for yourself. Yes. And I'd like to move on to some of my, basically, my, my yes. follow-up questions, if you don't mind. Yes, absolutely. So first, my questions have to do with costs. Mm-hmm. So you, you talk about, you know, we should understand that we can teach to a student's weaknesses, and we shouldn't just 
teach to their strengths because right. as we've sort of demonstrated, the mind is limitless and expandable and can, can fill in those gaps. Yes. I guess my question is, is it worth it? Is there a cost? Meaning, if I can teach, if there's a child who has demonstrated um, aptitude in the arts, but not mathematics, mm-hmm. why not just dump art education on him and make him the best possible artist possible, right? And wouldn't that be more cost effective than using resources to try to lift his STEM scores? It, I'm, I'm just, you know, mm. yeah, asking no, a question. It's an interesting yeah. argument. I think um, we could, I mean, that isn't a bad approach in education once people has shown, I would say, a love for something that maybe they focus on that, um, which is great. But I think we have, if we look at maths, for example, my favorite subject, (laughs) um, what we know is we have large, large uh, sections of the population who have anxiety around numbers, who could have gone into different pathways in their lives, but turned away from them because they felt they couldn't do maths and or were given the message, unfortunately, that they couldn't do maths. Um, so definitely, we, you know, if somebody is really excelling in something and loves it, I think it's fine to really focus on that. But we also need to think about all of those people who are just given the message that they can't do something that maybe would have been a really wonderful direction for their lives. And, you know, when we turn people away from maths, we basically turn them away from all of STEM. And one of the downsides we see in that is we have a very inequitable STEM workforce. If you look at those people taking higher degrees in STEM, or we go out in the workforce, two thirds of them are male, (laughs) maybe more than two thirds. So something's happening there. I mean, there's no reason for that other than we're turning other people off when we shouldn't be. I think you mentioned a study there where, I I could be getting this wrong, where in the absence of timing, of time tests, men and women did substantially the same. But when you introduced anxiety, I think it was, Mm -hmm. that that's that's when the female scores sort of dropped off a cliff. Something like that. I might be getting the details wrong. Yeah, that's right. One of the interesting findings, big international testing, 15 million students. Mm. And what we see when the international, this was a PISA testing, uh, tests were given out internationally. In many countries, boys outscored girls on those tests. Um, The majority of countries, actually. But the same year, they gave a test of collaborative problem solving where people took the test on their own, but they interacted with a computer agent, solving problems together, taking on their ideas. So when they gave that test of maths, girls outperformed boys in 51 of the 53 countries. So we know that um, what you're probably seeing there is girls are underperforming when they're sitting with an individual time test. We know that that happens a lot. Actually, a study came out of New York showing that entrance tests for elite schools, which maybe are going away, um, really under represent how well girls are doing. You see how well they're doing in school, but they don't do as well on those high pressure tests. So, um, yeah, that testing situation is not just girls who can be underperforming testing situations, but high pressure, high stakes um, Testing shuts down the brain of many people. Right. You mentioned that, how uh, fear or stress literally, or I guess physiologically, prevents yeah. your brain from making good decisions, if I can sum it up. That's you know? right, yeah. I mean, one of the studies, again, from neuroscience labs at Stanford, showed that when people with maths anxiety see numbers, a fear center lights up in their brain. It's the same fear center that lights up when we see snakes and spiders, And when that fear center lights up, the problem solving centers of the brain shut down. So just one of many reasons we don't want to make people afraid in classrooms. For sure. Uh, You mentioned the GNT test and I want to get to that uh, in closing. But first, I want to ask about the um, the plausibility of implementing your some of your your idea, not some of these ideas (laughs) in in, in U.S. public schools in particular. I know you are you have roots in both um, England here and here. Yeah. So, I mean, no, go on. Well, in, in particular, you mention a example of China versus the U.S. And the example you give is that in the U.S., a typical one-hour math class will have kids 
kind of grinding through 30 problems, right? Just getting through, mm -hmm. I guess that's one every two minutes, right? Right. Whereas in China, that same hour long class will be focused on just three problems with a deeper um, mm -hmm. struggle or attempt to get a, 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 not such a shallow understanding of the problems at hand. That's right. So I'm just thinking of kids in this area and a classroom of 30 kids. And uh, just for example, yeah. if even in a, a neutral situation where all the kids are exactly on the same level, right? I, mean, I guess I'm not yeah. sure how else to put it. Okay. Um, and one kid has a question and the other 29 kids are listening. Even that's brutal. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean in, in terms of the classroom, the way they're uh -huh. structured. Uh -huh. If you have one kid who's not quite as good as math, I'm, I hate to put it this way, and yeah. is asking a question that the other 29 kids know cold, that's just, that seems like a recipe for disaster. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one of the changes we advocate is really to change the nature of the kind of questions we do in classrooms. So you're, you're right um, in pointing out that in China, they work on a few questions and go into incredible depth. And uh, here we go through lots of short questions. And so when we, what we advocate for, we give in our own teaching of kids, uh, in my own teaching of undergrads at Stanford, is rich, open-ended, very visual, very uh, interesting tasks. And the kids dive into these tasks and they work on them together, some on their own, some together. And um, they discuss the outcomes. They see the different ways they think about them and talk about them. You don't have that classroom environment where it's about, okay, I have one answer here and I'm going to ask a question and see which one of you or two of you comes up with it. It's really different. I've just come from a couple of experiences, actually, that you might be interested in. Um, we brought 40 middle school girls to campus and taught them over the summer. And that was really interesting to me because when we started to ask questions and get them to think, they were so subdued and so unwilling to share ideas or to talk openly or to think. But two weeks later of doing these creative open tasks, we just couldn't hold them back. We we'd put things up for them and they were racing to come out to the front and talk about them. And they became, as I talk about in the book, they became unlocked and much freer in their thinking. But at the same time I was doing that, I was also teaching a hundred undergrads at Stanford <laughs> and <laughs> They were students who came in early in the summer. We were doing a calculus class together, but similarly, these open, rich problems. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting for me, even at Stanford, where the kids have really excelled, how many of them coming into our class talked about maths anxiety, about doubting themselves. They didn't mm. um, feel free to think openly. And in the first week of doing open problems with them, many of them uh, struggled and they didn't like that struggle because they had never struggled before. Mm -hmm. And they started, you know, being quite resistant. Like, why are we doing this? This isn't maths. Why am I having to struggle in this? But then I taught them for four weeks and their reflections at the end are really quite amazing. And they all talk about, they all say, wow, like, wow, I had never seen this maths before. This is just has not been part of my my schooling. And I came in thinking if I didn't answer something really quickly, there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you gave me hard problems, at first I thought this is terrible because I can't solve it really quickly. But then they realized that that really wasn't the goal and thinking deeply was the goal. So in both cases, really, I felt like we we're pushing these students through an intervention Mm -hmm. to really change how they think about their learning. And it had really big impact in both cases. I mean, I totally see how that would benefit in, let's say, a tutoring or even a homeschool type situation. But just my understanding of how public schools, traditional public schools are structured, it's just really hard to imagine, especially if you have various skill levels, which would then lead to the conclusion that, okay, this only makes sense. Please, you know, tell me if my mm -hmm. where my thinking is flawed, if you have tracking which you yeah. kind of are seemingly pretty strongly against. <laughs> Actually, it works. You know, so. <laughs> it is the very best approach when you have kids of different skill levels. And I would say in any classroom situation, you have that, whether they're tracked or not. You have kids who have different achievement, who think differently and think different speeds. 
And the worst thing to do is what's done in schools, which is to give them these short, narrow questions, which make, you know, some kids can't access them and some do them quickly. The, the approach we use, which is to give them much more open problems, is perfect for classrooms where people are in all different situations because they can take them to different places. I mean, I do say that heterogeneous classrooms are very productive, but what I don't think we need in those classrooms is everybody doing the same work and getting to the same places. What makes them productive is when you give problems that kids can take to different places. So what you find if somebody's very high achieving is they make they may take a task in a different direction and they actually often take them to the sky. I mean, way very different higher levels than in a regular class. So um, it's pretty exciting when you have kids who can do different things and then you can provide these different tasks for them. And I, as to whether this can work in the public schools, I, we formed our website, which is called U cubed mm -hmm. about three years ago. And we started putting these tasks out for teachers. In fact, this very week, we released what we call our week of inspirational maths. And we give out all these open rich tasks to teachers. So we have about half of the schools in the US using these tasks now. Oh, really? And they come back to us and say every time, wow, this just changed everything in my classroom. I had these kids who were really uninterested, suddenly very excited and the conversations were great. So I do think we can change teaching. That what's unfortunate, what the barrier is, is for many teachers in schools, in public schools, they have district tests, they mm. have pacing guides, yeah. they have really boring textbooks that they're meant to work through. So although we can get the teachers to leave all that aside and work on this beautiful maths for a week at the beginning of school, many of them say, oh, my gosh, the kids' lights were all on. It was so fantastic. And then that week ended and we got the textbooks out and the lights went out again. <laughs> so my challenge is how do we get teachers to do this the whole year round? And how do we get districts to understand that this is what we want people to be doing? racing through a textbook is not what we want people to be doing hmm. we're really? getting there though <laughs> i think for me at least the problem and in my inability to, to imagine that situation is probably a reflection of how i was educated <laughs> absolutely yes I, yeah. I wonder if you have, yeah, you have footage on your website to show the classroom in that style we have footage on our website and i i, I think it's great that you appreciate that people often cannot understand what I'm talking about because they haven't ever experienced it. And I always say, when people ask me, how do you change maths teachers? I always say, we have to sit with them and give them maths work to do differently. And then they suddenly start to see connections and see ideas they haven't seen before. And it's a very opening experience for them. But just talking about it, although it can create the spark for some people to go off and do it different, do things differently. It's usually not enough. You usually need more exposure. So yes, our website does have videos of classrooms, including our own classrooms that are uh, operating in this way. Cool. So I know we're getting up against um, time. So this last question is, it's not even a question. It's just more open-ended. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're, if you're up to date on um, the New York city specialized school, Controversy? I don't even know what to call it. That comes my news feed. Yes. <laughs> yes. So what I would say to those people who are sad that things like gifted and talented programs or designations may be going away mm -hmm. is we have a film on our website. It's called Rethinking Giftedness. Mm -hmm. And if you Google it, it will come up. And in this film, I just ask lots of Stanford undergrads to reflect on their life and labels with gifted labels. And it's pretty interesting hearing them talk because what they all talk about is how when they got those labels, they may have helped them in some ways and giving them extra resources, but they locked up their minds um, to the point that they felt that they couldn't struggle anymore they couldn't ask questions. One of them in the film says, I learned that other people could ask me questions. I couldn't ask questions. Um, one person said, you know, when I first struggled, I thought that thing inside me had run out. 
because these kids are getting the idea that they have a, a fixed attribute. And uh, I mean, it, I think it's absolutely right that we acknowledge some people are very high achieving and that's fantastic. And we need to give them really good work to work on. But giving them the idea that they have something inside them that's like a present that they have been given. <laughs> the word. Um, it's not something everybody can work towards. It's something that separates them from other people. I don't think that is a good message for learners. And I think um, studies hold that out. So so what about having, okay, first of all, changing the name from gifted just because of the uh, connotation there. But what about having like a relegation type system where you don't test in for K through eight, but you have to test every year and, and keep at it? Or is that too much pressure for the kids? <laughs> Well, I would say that we don't need to separate kids in those ways. Mm. And actually having schools with all different kinds of learners is the best type of school we can have. Mm. And those actually work very well for high achieving kids. We don't need to pull them into a separate school and put pressure on them. We can, they can be in the same school as other kids. And um, those are great places actually where we find that there's very high achievement and students doing really well. So, so, I mean, I San think, Francisco. I, sorry, no, I think you, you mentioned that, you know, every kid should be at the edge of their learning. That's right. right? So the how would that work learning. in a blended type situation? Yeah. Well, for the, for the quote unquote high achieving kids. Yeah, yeah we, we, we need all kids to be at the edge of their understanding and pushing at that edge. So I don't think this works well in tracked schools or in gifted and talented schools, actually, because we give people work that doesn't push them at the edge of their understanding. If you're in a mixed school, you have to acknowledge as the teacher that kids are in different places and I need to provide work that will allow them go, to go to different places. So it's not about putting them all in the same school and everybody doing the same work and some kids being held back and some kids really being out of their depth. It's about providing different opportunities for kids in those classrooms. They sit together, they learn together, but maybe they take work to a different place and that's great. Very good. Uh, Joe, that's all I have. Um, I want to make sure everyone gets a peek at Limitless Mind. Is that going to come out backwards? I actually don't know. Anyway, it's releasing on September 3rd. Um, really great read uh, for any parent. Thank you. Um, and, or, you know, anyone interested in understanding the, uh, mm, the almost endless possibilities of all of our brains, even retired cab drivers, yeah? <laughs> that's right. I mean, I think these ideas are helpful for all of us adults as well as younger learners. Joe, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? Uh, no, I don't think so. I appreciate chatting with you and getting the book out. That's really helpful. When will this go out? Uh, well, I'm thinking this will be just after your actual launch date. So probably a middle of September, right. maybe early September. And is it visual? You, you held up the book. It's just an audio recording, isn't it? We're also going on YouTube as well. Oh, okay. I'll be happy is to send you both. Is that film with both of us? Or just yes, you? Yes, yes. No, no, this, is, this has both of us. Oh, I didn't know that. I should have put my better <laughs> shirt on. Okay. <laughs> well, Joe, I'm going to sign off the recording here, but why don't you stay on the line and, uh, and we'll say goodbye that way, all right? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll talk again next time. Thank you, Joe.